Welcome to the uh, eloquence of the apes conference. So we're all eloquent. Right? <laughs> this conference offers a uniquely transdisciplinary take on the recent scholarly uh, developments touching on the evolutionary and cultural approaches to language and communication in great apes. This latter category being understood here in the most extensive sense, encompassing the range of animals, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, modern humans, and their fossil ancestors. <coughs> this workshop <coughs> is linked with the recent donation of Sue Savage Rumble uh, to the Cornell University Library of the video archive documenting apes using human language over several uh, hundreds of hours of footage and almost two decades of life. And we saw some of those. Uh, some excerpts of these video archived yesterday in the uh, prelude to this conference. Uh, but today, in addition to the focal problem of these workshops about language, human communication, and apes, this event is also conceived as an experiment for scholars from the humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences to move past the disciplinary limitations and open a real space for debate. This is why we will try to keep each talk around 30 to 35 minutes, which might be hard for some, uh, mainly me, for instance. But we will try to discuss for 25 minutes uh, at least uh, after each talk. So that's why we have one hour each. The unusually large nature, uh, intellectually, of our forum also explains why we have so many sponsors to thank at this point, uh, namely the Society for the Humanities, where we are. Uh, the Department of Roman Studies, the Dean's Office in the uh, Humanities Division, uh, the Department of Comparative Literature, the Department of Psychology, the Cognitive Science Program, the Rawls Professorship in the Humanities, uh, the Division of Rare and Manuscripts from the Cornell University Library, and even Phi Capabella, because we have video everywhere thanks to the grant there. Uh, Penelope Murab has been absolutely instrumental in the uh, preparation of these sometimes hectic uh, first days of, of, uh, of, of workshop. So I really thank her for having uh, worked with me. I also thank uh, my new driver, Joseph Friedman, who drove us yesterday to and from Syracuse Airport to pick up Sue Savage Rumbo, who had been lost somewhere by American, United, and all the uh, beautiful <laughs> air companies that we have in this country. Um, and I will add at the end of this short introduction that this workshop is uh, dedicated to the many humans and non-human uh, apes who spend their lives uh, testing, being testing, probing, being probed uh, in experiments sometimes uh, over many decades. And the workshop is especially dedicated to the memory of uh, two pioneers who recently passed away, uh, Lana Chimpanzee and Dwayne Rumble. This is time now for, yeah. even a bit ahead of time, for first uh, half, first panel of the uh, of the day uh, on the evolution and origin of communication in human and non-human primates, and we will begin with a talk delivered by Martin Christiansen. Martin is a professor of psychology and the co-director of the cognitive science program at Cornell University. He also holds a professorship at Aarhus University and is a senior scientist at the Haskins Lab. Morton has authored or co-authored more than 175 articles, but I believe it's close to 200 now. But he also co-edited several volumes, including Language Evolution, Language Universal, uh, Cultural Evolution. He recently published Creating Language with the MIT Press. And I have been told that he is currently co-teaching a wonderful class on <laughs> culture, cognition, and the humanities. <laughs> Martin's research has been instrumental in the intellectual reshaping of cognitive science in general through a novel assessment of human language and of its origins. So it is particularly fitting, of course, to begin our workshop with his talk, a talk entitled Language Evolution Through the Bottleneck from Milliseconds to Millennia. Science is uh, very happy to support this, of course. Um, 
What I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about language evolution and ways in which people are thinking about language evolution. Um, so I'm going to be focusing primarily on one of the apes, namely the human ape, but I will uh, discuss various things that are relevant for thinking about our relationship with the other great apes uh, as well, as I'm um, talking about how we create language uh, across multiple timescales from milliseconds to millennia. But before we get into this, um, I just want to um, echo and uh, re-emphasize uh, the need for uh, an integrated approach to language. So language is an incredibly complex phenomena, uh, language and communication, and if we really want to understand it uh, at its full complexity, we need to uh, look across disciplinary boundaries and uh, boundaries and work together. So Nick Chayla and I wrote a comment in uh, Nature Human Behavior uh, earlier this year in July where what we pointed out is that um, in order to understand language we really need to integrate the language sciences uh, and the study of language more generally rather than separating it out across many different di disciplines that tend not to talk to one another. And uh, it's with that in mind I've been uh, very excited to co-teach this uh, seminar that Laurent was mentioning uh, this semester on um, uh, culture, cognition and the humanities in which we touch upon uh, issues such as the ones we've been discussing today but also many others relating to understanding um, human, uh, the human condition and its role in nature more generally. Um, now, when it comes to language evolution and to thinking about language more generally, one of the main sets of questions that we often ask is, you know, why is language the way it is and how did it come to be that way? And that's what uh, many of us are really interested in across uh, different disciplines. Uh, and uh, we approach these questions from a variety of different perspectives. Now, for a very long time, uh, so the answer to these questions has been sold um, in, in a way that makes human unique. Uh, sort of creating a chasm between humans and the other great, say, great apes. So we have the suggestions, for example, that we, uh, why only us, a book that Chomsky co-wrote recently, and of course, uh, Steven Pinker in the language instinct argued for uh, something very unique to humans that makes us very different, creating a chasm between us and the other great apes in terms of thinking about language and communication. Now, this approach, however, has become uh, less uh, dominant in the uh, areas of language science in the last couple of decades. And so whereas the mainstream answer used to be from Chomsky, Pinker and others used to be that uh, the answer to the question I raised earlier was that there's some sort of biological um, endowment that we have specific to language that makes us special and makes us different from other uh, the other great apes. But as I mentioned, uh, uh, so the, the question that people have been asking is why is the brain so well suited for learning language? Now, since the beginning of the 2000s, we have realized that that's the wrong question to answer, uh, sort of to ask. But rather what we should ask instead is why is language so well suited to being learned by the brain? And this is sort of the revolution that has been in the study of language evolution, as it were, uh, looking at from a new point of cultural transmission and cultural evolution. So the answer um, that people have put forward, or the suggestion is that uh, linguistic structure and language more generally emerges through cultural transmission of language and uh, aspects of communication across many generations of learners and users. Now, this perspective suggests that this chasm that previously has been talked about between us, the humans, and the, great, and the other great apes is not as uh, big. In fact, there is no chasm at all. It's a matter of degree rather than uh, sort of, of uh, being in different categories, as it were. Now, this way of thinking about language uh, is actually not a new one. It's actually one that Darwin already talked about uh, in The Descent of Man. Um, he suggested that uh, the formation of different languages and of distinct species and the proofs that both have been developed through a gradual process are curiously the same. He went on to uh, cite the uh, philologist Max Müller 
uh, for saying that a struggle for life is constantly going on among the words and grammatical forms in each language. The better, the shorter, the easier forms are constantly gaining the, gaining the upper hand. And then Darwin concluded that the survival and preservation of certain favorite words in the struggle for existence is natural selection. So what Darwin points out here is that we can think of language evolution as a, uh, in terms of cultural evolution, but on the same on par with uh, the way we look at natural selection in biology. Now this perspective, um, the idea that language is shaped by our abilities, by the human brain, is one that Nick Chait and I put forward in a, a paper in BBS uh, in 2008, or, we, or it's one, um, um, uh, instantiation of this idea, not the only one, of course. Um, and the basic idea was that the structure in language that we see across uh, the world uh, arise from neural constraints on how we learn and process language. And these constraints derive from the way our thought processes work. Um, of course, our brains are embodied in uh, a complex body, and so we also get constraints from the body in terms of sensory motor constraints. We get constraints about how we interact with one another, how we live in social communities and engage with one another. And of course, there are constraints from cognition, from learning, memory, and processing. Um, and this is where much of my own work uh, has been uh, focused. Now, the basic idea is that uh, through cultural transmission uh, involving repeated, repeated cycles of learning and use, these constraints would have shaped language into what we've seen, what we see today. Now, importantly, um, this involved cultural submission not only vertically across generations of language learners and users, but also within generations in terms of interactions between uh, language users. So the basic idea here is that similar to reading, which we know is a cultural uh, product, as uh, a culturally evolved function, um, we should expect uh, language to involve redeployment of low-level uh, brain circuits uh, as part of a neural network to uh, accommodate linguistic functions. And indeed, word, uh, sorry, work in the uh, continuous sciences sort of support that perspective. So some of the work by uh, Michael Anderson fit very nicely with that. Uh, one prediction from this perspective is that we, would ex we should expect that neural circuits, circuits in general should be very uh, multipurpose. So, um, when uh, Michael Anderson and I um, don't know the first one, Pernod Wilker, uh, they did analysis where they looked at 78 standard anatomical uh, regions uh, that were active across more than a thousand experimental tasks uh, in 11 different kinds of domains. So, this was action execution, action observation, action inhibition, attention, audition, vision, motion, language. Um, reasoning, explicit memory, uh, working memory. And what they found was that uh, essentially each of these uh, anatomical regions would be uh, active in more than one of these uh, domains. So what you see here is uh, sort of the activity, um, uh, sort of the outcome of this analysis and the, the color patterns are such that the red end means that it's close to one, meaning that they are uh, essentially active in all of these 11 domains they're looking at, whereas when you get close to uh, zero, that would mean that they're uh, not active uh, in, or they'll only be active in a single domain. As you can see, there's a lot of red and orange here, meaning that most of the circuits are going to be active in a lot of different domains as uh, one would expect. Uh, Michael Anderson also did another analysis that looked at another prediction from this framework, namely that more, the idea is that more recently evolved cognitive functions should be more widely distributed across the brain because it's sort of uh, recruiting different areas in order to uh, use that to piggyback its function on. Um, so what you see here is analysis of co-activation of Brotman areas, these are sort of particular areas of the brain, for eight different tasks uh, across uh, 472 fMRI experiments. So uh, these tasks were reasoning, memory, emotion, mental imagery, visual perception, action, and attention. And what you see are just results from action, which is sort of the, um, um, one of the older uh, functions. And the uh, black lines indicate areas that are adjacent to one another, whereas the orange line indicate areas that are non-adjacent to one another. As you can see in, in action, uh, there's many more black 
uh, connections, whereas for language, language involves recruitment of areas across uh, uh, the brain more generally. And indeed, language was the most widely distributed of the kind of uh, domains they looked at. So this sort of a, uh, is by way of a backdrop for thinking about the cultural evolution of language and what we might uh, think of in this regard. But, of course, when it comes to doing uh, work in this, what we want is looking closer at what kind of constraints that may shape the cultural evolution of language. And here I'll point to one constraint that I've been working on uh, quite a bit uh, lately, namely um, what uh, Nick Chade and I refer to the now and ever bottleneck. Now, one of the things we know about language, of course, is that it happens in the here and now. So if you didn't listen to what I just said, it's going to be gone. Um, if you were a language learner and you didn't learn from what I just said, it's going to be gone. You cannot go back and play it back in your head unless you process it in some way. And indeed, um, uh, the language input uh, presents us with a very formidable uh, challenge, um, which we refer to as an hour number bottleneck. So on the one hand, uh, the linguistic input is incredibly transient. Um, the acoustic trace only stays around for uh, less than tenth of a, a tenth of a second. That is a really short amount of time, and then it's gone if you don't do something with it. But not only is the input highly transient, it also comes at us at a really comes at us at a really rapid rate. So, on average, a speaker will produce between 10 to 15 phonemes uh, per second. And we know for a long time that sound that comes at us at that rapid pace, if it's non-linguistic, we, we cannot distinguish these sounds from one another. So if you, if you heard no, 10 non-language uh, sounds at the speed of, at a rate of 10 per second, it would just sound like a buzz to you. You could not separate one from one another. But not only is the, uh, the input highly transient and come at us at a really rapid rate, we're also pathetic when it comes to actually picking up on sequences of this kind of information. So we know from, again, a long time ago, that uh, if you were asked to remember just four non-speech sounds, so something like a buzz, a hiss, a tone, say another tone, and all you had to do was remember the order of them, you would actually do really poorly on that. Um, and of course, we also know from the memory literature that if it, even when it comes to actual verbal elements, uh, our memory for the, these kind of elements are really short uh, as well, on the order of between four and seven, depending on whether you are a Cohen memory person or a Miller uh, memory person. <laughs> now, importantly, um, this is a general constraint of cognition. It's not something that just applies to language, but but. There's actually an aspect of, of language, of human communication, that makes it even worse, and that is turn-taking. So the, the speed of turn-taking is incredibly rapid in a normal conversation, and it's something I unfortunately don't have time to come into, but please do ask me about it in questions, because there's some interesting uh, differences between, uh, no, between the uh, monkeys and apes and so on in verbal and non-verbal turn-taking. So just, I'm just putting this out there. <laughs> Um, now, so uh, because it's a general constraint, it also applies to sign language uh, as well. So this really puts an immense, immense uh, sort of challenge to our language system. So how do we get around that? Well, the suggestion is um, chunking. Um, now, chunking is something we've studied in memory literature for a very long time. And I just want to give you an idea about how this works. Uh, so let's do a little experiment. So I hope you're actually awake here. So now you will be tested. Um, and it's been recorded, so. All right. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to read a string aloud to you. And when I do this, I want you to read it back to me. It's a string of letters. All right. Ready? C, T, A, H. E P A L C P I A R C C A H All right. Okay. So you just demonstrated the limitations on our working memory capacity here. So um, now I just told you that this is way beyond your uh, 
uh, your, your memory ability, of course. It's 13 letters, so it's hard. Um, so I was kind of tricky here, but it's early in the morning. I'll give you a, a, I'll give you a second chance, all right? <laughs> so hopefully you can redeem yourself. Are you ready? C A T A P P L E C H A I R C A T A P P L E C H A I R. Whoa! How did you do that? It's the same 13 letters from before. What's different? Well, they were put together into words. And what you did when you repeated it, you actually chunked the letters here into three words. And you can remember three words. So the basic idea of what we do uh, more generally in the language system is something very similar to this. We chunk the information as quickly as possible using basic memory mechanisms similar to what you just demonstrated here uh, in order to be able to process language. Now, crucially, this is highly dependent on experience with language. So if you didn't speak and read English, you would not be able to do that. You would not get any improvement. So this is something we have to learn. It comes with development, of course. So, the suggestion is that the way we deal with the now remember bottleneck is through what Nick Chait and I have called uh, chunk and pass processing. So we chunk language input as quickly as possible and pass it up to higher level of linguistic representation. And each time we pass it up to a higher level of, of linguistic representation, that buys us more time to uh, deal uh, with the input. Now this means that language will show a strong bias towards incremental processing and in particular representational uh, locality. So we chunk across neighboring units and we'll uh, make generalization in our uh, neighboring uh, units. Now that doesn't mean we can't do things that are longer in nature but uh, there's going to be a strong bias towards uh, local information. Now importantly, this perspective also provides a natural way of explaining why we, when we think about language, we tend to divide language up into different levels of representation, phonology, morphology, syntax, and so on and so forth. That this is an outcome of this repeated process of, of chunk and pass uh, processing. And so what we see, we have, it gives us multiple levels of linguistic structure that uh, in which we have increasingly more compressed representations as we move up uh, in the uh, hierarchy. And uh, at each higher level of representation, we have longer retention of the information, but less of the original detail. We also, uh, it also creates a bias towards predictive processing that will try to use as much information as possible uh, to be right first time when we are chunking the information because we cannot backtrack, we cannot go back because that information will rapidly be gone or overwritten by new incoming information. And importantly, this means that we use top-down information, expectations from discourse, from semantics, real-world knowledge, uh, in order to be uh, right first time. So let me give you a uh, sort of little picture of what this might look like. Um, so here we have time across here, we have sort of acoustic input and then we might first initially chunk uh, that acoustic input into some sound based units. Now here I talk about phonology but the theory doesn't really care about whether it's phonemes, syllables, the, the only thing it cares about is that there should be some sort of sound based unit. So if you're a syllable person it can be syllables, if you're a phoneme person it can be phonemes, it doesn't matter from our perspective. Now, what happens is that that buys you a little time, but as you get many phonemes, you're going to get interference between them. It's a common phenomenon in memory, uh, the memory uh, research. And what we do is we compress that into uh, yet a higher level that can be word, word combinations, and so on. And we keep on doing that until we get up to uh, discourse uh, information. Now, this is just made as a hypothetical um, sort of picture. There may be more. Uh, levels and indeed different languages may use different ways of carving up uh, this way of uh, chunking. 
And so what you see here is, is comprehension, and the theory is that production pretty much follow the same process but in the reverse, starting with some sort of idea of what we want to express at a discourse level, going to intonational phrases, to words, to sounds, to articulatory uh, gestures, and so on. Now, importantly, this perspective on uh, on language, the now minimum bottleneck at the time scale of, uh, of the utterance in the milliseconds has implications uh, at the time scale of the individual uh, because each processing episode, as illustrated here, uh, becomes an opportunity for learning. So the idea is that from the viewpoint of um, this perspective, what language acquisition consists in is essentially learning to be, become better at chunk and pass processing. The child must learn how to create and integrate the right chunks rapidly before the input is gone. So this is the different ways from sort of the very classic way of looking at language acquisition where there's some grammar out there that a child has to learn. That's a wrong way of thinking about it. That's like cheating the, treating the child as a linguist. The child is not a linguist. The child is a, is a developing language user. That's what this picture uh, suggests, namely that language acquisition is simply learning to become better at processing. It's not something magic about finding a grammar out there. Now, they also mean that a child has to be an eager learner. It has to use online using all the available information, not just syntax information, but everything that's available, multiple cues, and so on. Uh, and the child must learn in here and now using this information. Again, generalization and processing will be local, so learning has abstractions over input has to be done uh, within the limited memory uh, window. And the child also uh, engages in predictive learning. Uh, they gradually learn to apply top-down information from what they know about the world, uh, discourse expectations, pragmatics, and so on, in order to facilitate processing via prediction. Now, importantly, the now and bottleneck not only influences language processing and acquisition, but also provides an important constraint on language evolution, uh, as each individual uh, is part of a broader community of language users and thus helps shape the cultural evolution of language more generally. So let me, uh, whoops, that was a bit too quick. Let me recap very quickly here. Um, oh, it's going slower than I thought. Um, jump and pass uh, processing, uh, Nick Chade and I have uh, suggested, is key to overcoming this immense challenge. Uh, that's, it, it's interesting me that, that derives from the now and never bottom leg. It's actually, we sometimes refer to this as an inconvenient truth in the language sciences because we've known about these these limitations for a very long time. They were discovered like in the 1960s, yet most theories subsequent to that have completely ignored them. Um, so what the system, language system has to do is rapidly uh, compress and integrate uh, the input with prior information uh, and pass it on to higher levels of abstraction. And in this perspective, language acquisition simply involves learning how to do chunk and pass processing, how, how to become better at processing. And that uh, also the now and ever bottleneck can shape the cultural evolution of language. So, can we give any evidence of this? So, I'm going to go through some uh, data very quickly here to give you a little evidence uh, in this direction. Um, one of the things we wanted to see was whether constraints on how we chunk information can. Uh, lead to the emergence of structure that looks language-like in an interesting way. And for that purpose, we adopted uh, a new experimental paradigm that allows you to study cultural evolution in the, in the lab that was developed by uh, Simon Kirby and colleague at the University of Edinburgh. It's essentially kind of like a game of telephone. So you know the childhood game where you, know, you have one kid, they'll uh, um, whisper something into somebody's ear, that kid will whisper it into somebody else's ear, and so on and so forth, and then you see what comes out at the end, oftentimes very different from what you started with. So what this experimental paradigm does is essentially the same thing, but just in the lab. So hand chunking biases um, of the sort that I've talked about lead to the cultural evolution of structure independent of any language line task. So, to, so in this case, we're actually trying to take communication completely out of it in order to see whether just limitations on memory and chunking can lead to some interesting uh, kind of structure.
So what we did was that we gave uh, subjects come into the lab, uh, they would be exposed to 15 consonant strings. So these strings were generated by three to five characters, uh, they were three to five characters long, uh, we used six different consonants to create them. And importantly, uh, the first person to come in would always get uh, a flat distribution, so there's no kind of structure in what they were exposed to. Um, then after they, next, they would see a string on a, on a screen, it would disappear, they would type it in, and they sort of doing that for several blocks. And then we would give them a recall test, where we asked them to recall all 15 strings. Now, of course, that's pretty much impossible, but we just have them give us strings until they give us 15. Now, importantly, one of the things that happens when you're doing things on a keyboard is that it shows, you know, certain keys are next to one another, there are certain things that are easier to, in, to type in than others. So to avoid typing biases and things like anagrams, what we would do is that between, uh, when we took the output from one person uh, and before we gave it to the next person, we would sort of remap things uh, in the surface level. So as you can see here, X from, say this might, might be the first person, what the next person would see is that we replace all x's with v, all m's with t, and so on and so forth. So it's the same, it's the same sort of underlying structure, it just it, there's different letters, and that way we can take out any kind of uh, typing biases. And so we would give it to the next person, and then we would have 10 persons following uh, the same principle. So uh, train, they give us some strings, and we give it to the next. What we found was that over, over time, the strings would become more uh, similar to one another. This is any distance, essentially how similar it is once, how many items, how many letters do you have to change in one string to get to another string. So when you compare from uh, somebody at generation N to generation N plus one, you can look at how similar the strings are to one another. And you can see they get more similar to one another. You get an overlap in subparts of strings, interestingly. And indeed, what we see emerging is structural reuse that people begin to use little subchumps that they keep on repeating over and over again. And so we may want to ask, but does that actually meet, leads to better learning? Yes, indeed it does. Uh, what you see here is the average uh, recall initially is about four, and at the end they were able to uh, recall twice as many, indicating that uh, actually developed a uh, sort of by cultural evolution a system that was easier to learn. Now I also have some additional analysis I don't have time to get into, but what we see here in this experiment is that language-like distribution regularities emerge facilitating learning. And in some other analysis using network analysis, we're able to show that the pattern of structural reuse uh, we saw emerging here is very similar to what we see in child-directed speech, for example. So what this suggests is that constraints on chunking amplified for cultural evolution may have shaped aspects of linguistic structure. Now I want to say that it's not the only constraint, so remember that all these other constraints are in play. So it's just one constraint, but uh, an important one. But, but is this kind of chunking relevant for how we process language more generally? Um, uh, we, uh, one of my graduate students, former graduate students, um, Stuart McCauley, we looked at that by essentially giving people a task very similar to the one that you were exposed to. Um, but in, rather than giving sort of random letter strings, what we would do instead is actually use a corpus analysis to find subchunks uh, of consonants uh, that occur very frequently uh, in uh, sort of a large corpus of text. The idea is that if you are sensitive to the frequency of these sub-patterns of these chunks, it should be easier to recall them uh, even though they don't make words like the ones that were in the experiments that I did earlier. And indeed, what we found was that when we had um, uh, these items that were chunked, they were better recalled than the control items. Now, the control items were essentially the same letter strings, but not pseudo-randomized to check out any structure. Now, there's not a lot of difference in these particular analyses here, but there was a lot of individual differences. So one of the interesting questions is, is your chunking ability as measured by this task, is that related to how good you are at processing language more generally? That's sort of part of the prediction of this kind of framework, and indeed it is. So here we had people reading uh, online uh, subject relative uh, sentences, and I won't bore you with subject relative sentences. And unless you really want to, 
uh, I can do that in questions, but what we found importantly was that there was a correlation uh, between how good people were at the chunking task in general, uh, how good they were at chunking, and how good they are at processing these sentences. These are complex syntactic constructions online, and even more so when we have object relative sentences. But what about acquisition? Well, in another study uh, headed by Aaron Istelin, who was sitting there, uh, we wanted to uh, develop a way of sort of testing uh, sensitivity to chunking uh, in an artificial context, in the context of an artificial language. So, uh, and this is oftentimes referred to as the statistical learning. And we know from a lot of studies that statistical learning is a skill that appears to be involved in language more generally and is predictive of language skill um, more generally. So what we did was we took a sort of a classic statistical learning task in which participants are uh, exposed to distribution information. Uh, so they hear a long string of just syllables, and these syllables are actually uh, consist, uh, are combined together to trisyllabic words that are randomly concatenated. They have no pauses or anything between words. So. Uh, the only cue to structure here is that if you pick up on the fact that uh, within the syllables here, the transition probabilities is going to be uh, very high, uh, you always get Google following key and so on, uh, but between them it's going to drop uh, because there's many things that can come after Boo, um, uh, or not many, there's a few things that can, many more things that can come after Boo than uh, after key, for example. So this is a classic task that was developed by Jenny Safran and colleague, but we uh, wanted to do make a new twist on it using chunking as a main way of measuring. The rationale was that if people are sensitive to uh, distributional structure, they should be able to chunk it uh, implicitly, and we should be able to show that if we give them a recall task. So that's exactly what we did. Um, we expected that people would chunk together these frequent patterns and this should show up as a, a superior recall for uh, words. So when we gave them two words from this string that were actually true to these trisyllabic words, they should be able to recall this just fine. But when we take the same syllables and we um, uh, create sort of two non words and we should randomize them, they should be uh, making more errors here. So here you can see they're uh, reversing uh, these two in this case. And indeed, um, when we did this with adults, this is exactly uh, what Aaron found namely, that uh, people are much better at uh, recalling the chunk information than the uh, control items. Here. Now, so what this means is that in during a fairly short amount of time, people can pick up on these kind of patterns that you demonstrated earlier. Now, of course, your exposure to English is much more substantial than what people get in, in these kind of lab bed experiments, but this is a way we can measure this very easily. And interestingly, we can use this to look at children's acquisition as well. So in a study that we're currently conducting in, in Australia, um, we uh, took this task uh, giving, and gave it to uh, 115 uh, five to six year old kids um, along with a bunch of other tasks and um, what we found was that their recall performance, so this is the task is called, um, I forgot to mention this earlier, statistically induced chunking recall uh, task uh, or SICKER and so SICKER performance uh, what we found uh, correlates uh, very nicely with the children's language comprehension uh, performance now importantly, this correlation still held even when we control for things that are otherwise uh, sort of suggested to play a role in language comprehension, namely verbal working memory, nonverbal IQ, vocabulary and age. Even when we factored all those, um, those things out, we still had a significant correlation indicating there's something special about chunking and that we're measuring with this task that plays a role in uh, language acquisition. So to recap here, um, what these data suggest, and we have uh, even more data in the works, is that our basic chunking abilities is incredibly important for, uh, for language, not only in online language processing in adults, but also appear to be, play a role in language acquisition as well. 
So chunking here uh, in line with predictions from the now and never bottleneck framework uh, may be crucial to language processing and acquisition. But again, as I stress, not the only constraint in our language. Now importantly though, this perspective here, going back to uh, my original slide here, um, uh, the idea of the cultural evolution of language uh, suggests that there's really no sharp dividing line between the great apes and uh, the other great apes and humans, but rather we are sort of all on the same side. It just might be a matter of degree rather than a categorical difference between us. But uh, this, of course, doesn't mean that there hasn't been specific human uh, adaptations, biologically speaking, during our, our evolution. Uh, it just happens to be that they may not have been for language in particular. That's uh, the general perspective here. So this leaves the question is, uh, why don't apes have language, uh, at least in, in uh, certain ways of looking at it? Well, one suggesting, uh, uh, borrowing from uh, um, uh, suggesting from Jeff Elman from a long time ago, and they also we developed in the Creating Language books, Nick Chater and I, is that what makes that language is piggybacking uh, on these many different skills. Uh, well, these are skills that we see in other species as well, including uh, both monkeys and other uh, great apes, but also other species such as humpback whales. There's a lot of really exciting work on uh, the cultural evolution of uh, certain aspects of uh, song in humpback whales and so on. And we also, of course, there's been a lot of work recently on, uh, on bird song. The point is that there are many different skills that go into uh, allowing cultural evolution to take off. So there is reasoning about communicative attention, joint attention, uh, intention, joint attention, imitation, vocal tract control, uh, being able to be a good vocal learner, uh, complex sequence learning uh, of which chunking is uh, important, learning arbitrary for meaning mappings, and all sorts of things. And, and the suggestion here is that these are not unique skills for humans, but uh, these are skills we see to lesser or higher degree in other species. Some species may even be better at us in some of these skills. But what may be the case is that humans have sort of a critical mass of capabilities in all of these skills put together that allow language to take off by way of cultural evolution. Now, this should also have uh, included turn taking, which is an incredibly important part of language that puts an important constraint on language. The point here is that there's no magic bullet when it comes to uh, language evolution. Oftentimes, if you, if you go to language evolution conferences, all, people will focus on this. This is what makes language possible in humans, or this. So, like Chomsky is merge, uh, others it's uh, joint attention, others is this or that, and so on. And the suggestion here is that no, it's not a single thing. It's language is sort of, we, we're not special in that we have this one thing that makes language possible. Um, it's a combination of many different things that allow language to emerge, uh, none of which uh, may be unique to human. So, in conclusion here, um, uh, what I've suggested here is that linguistic structure is a product of cultural evolution, not biological adaptation, primarily. And what we need to do, uh, sort of across the uh, language sciences, the humanities, and so on, um, is to uncover the constraints that work across evolution, acquisition, and processing. I'm pointing to one constraint, again, only one, uh, the now never bottleneck as a key constraint on language. Uh, and I've given you some preliminary evidence suggesting that chunking could have played a role in shaping evolution, acquisition, and processing of language. But I also want to stress, and I think this is important, that you know, we get away from these magic bullet theories of language evolution. There is no one thing that makes uh, are special. Um, with that, I want to uh, thank my collaborators on this work, uh, my long-time collaborator Nick Chater from University of Warwick, former graduate student uh, uh, Rick Dale, now at UCLA, uh, Simon, uh, Simon Kirby from University of Edinburgh, Hannah Cornish, formerly from University of Stirling, Stuart McCauley, former graduate student from here, who's now at uh, University of Liverpool, Aaron Ispelin, uh, who's here, and Ellen Kidd, who is at the MPI for Site Linguistics in Nineveh. So, thank you, everyone. So, we have 25 minutes also to open discussion.
not themselves. Who would like to begin? Sue and Sue and Kathy. Go ahead. Kathy. Well, it's just a question about what you very simple question. So, the, were you saying that some of the chunking um, experiments involve uh, non-word patterns that people so uh, people were better at recognizing patterns of words, uh, patterns of letters that were regular as opposed to random, whether or not they actually matched words in the language. So, ours did in the second sequence. But you were so. Could you explain the difference between the entirely random and the ones? that were easier, and then also did they develop a skill to chunk while they were uh, taking the... Taking so, so you're thinking of this experiment here? Uh, yeah. So, so this experiment, this is com these are complete, these are all non, in a sense they're all non-words, right. because they, you know, uh, keep or do is not a word of English as far as I know. It might be a, a word in some other language uh -huh. for all I know. However, so the theory is that you are learning this language. There's no meaning here. So this is sort right. of purely looking at your your sort of ability to pick up patterns mm -hmm. at that level. Um, now the theory is that what we count as so a, a word here would be words that actually f follow in that string, but non-words uh, would be essentially combination of the same syllables, uh -huh. but that didn't occur in that language. Uh -huh. So the theory is that that they, they shouldn't. They should show facilitation in recalling. In essentially, they, if they picked up on the pattern, they should be able to chunk that more easily for the words they've been exposed to, as opposed to these non-words that they okay. only see here. And that's indeed what we what we found. So they would make errors like uh, like this. And what is it? What is turn taking? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, you're my favorite. <laughs> so. Turn taking. You're so happy. <laughs> so you happy. had prepared that. <laughs> now, the reason why the reason why I, I was really sort of begging for questions about turn taking because I didn't have time to put it in is that um, uh, there's a beautiful article in Trends in Computer Science by Stephen Lemonson about turn taking, and and it, it it's one thing that just makes an area of bottleneck even worse. So there was a beautiful study done by folks at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics uh, in 2009 by Steiger Sedell. What they did, they analyzed interactions between people, so people just uh, talking to one another, uh, ac across different languages and across different cultures. So there was both languages from Europe, but also from Africa, from Indonesia, and so on. What they found was amazingly uh, is that they that when you look at how, how much time is there between one person finishes their turn and the other person starts there, on average, it's about 200 milliseconds. That's incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. That is really, really fast. So you can see this is sort of what it looks like. Now, why, why is this fast? This is incredibly fast. Because um, what it means is the implications for the pressure on the language system is just uh, truly amazing on top of the now and ever bottleneck. Um, and that is that what you have to do uh, in order to be able to do this, that uh, you have to keep in mind that if I were just, just thinking of a word and then producing it, it takes roughly about 600 milliseconds. So if you're shown a picture and you have to name it, it takes about 600 milliseconds. That's how, that's, at the ten, that's how long it takes for us to say a word. Now, that's, of course, three times as long as this pause. Now, some languages, like Japanese, apparently, that the pause is closer to zero. Um, now, what this means is that we, at very, at very early on in the turn of the other person, we have to start thinking about what the speech act is. So, is it a question? Is it an instruction? Is it a, you know, a declarative um, uh, statement? We have to sort of figure that out very early on in the turn before they're you know, halfway into it. Then we have to start looking at when the turn will end. We have to start predicting that. And we're actually pretty good at that. That's why sometimes you have you know, people finishing each other's sentences and so on. But we're good at that even with, with strangers. And then, of course, we have to pick out when, um, when, that, when we really know that it's happening, and when we have to start, uh, then we have to start articulating. Now, crucially, it takes about 300 milliseconds to program your articulators to move, right? So, uh, so, so this, is, this is amazing. This has in, incredible 
uh, implications for how we communicate. The problem is that much of the work in psycholinguistics have been looking at monologue, right? Not like I'm doing now. This is not how we normally communicate. This is not, I would argue, what language evolved for. Language evolved for interacting with one another. And so this is sort of the normal situation. Yet most of what studied is actually treating it at monologue. So um, when you look at this perspective, it just puts time pressure even more on the system. So we have to do all this stuff at an incredible pace. Um, and so what we have to learn to do is you know, do all this chunking and you know, following an hour and ever fun like, but doing it so quickly that we can re respond in this amazingly fast way. And this is where it becomes interesting because when we look at, because we're talking about apes and primates here, there's some interesting differences across the uh, primate lineage. So uh, in monkeys, we see uh, across the board, both in the old world and new world, we see a lot of work, uh, vocal uh, turn taking. We see very little in the other great apes. There is gestural tone taking, um, but not a lot of vocal tone taking, at least according to uh, these analyses here. Now, we do see in the howler monkeys, of course, those are famous for uh, duets and so on. Um, but this is why I think tone taking is so important and it's so, again, overlooked. It's one of these things that, that we have sort of thought of language as this monologue that or oftentimes even things that are written down rather than in the actual moment-to-moment -moment interaction and the constraints on our theories should come from sort of the ecological uh, situation in which we normally use language namely in interaction with one another and then you see you get these extreme constraints here Thank and that's why I think they're important. Thank you, Martin. You also primed everybody here for my own talk, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking about direct. Sue, you want to? Well, I think it was excellent. And I agree with everything you said. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to note that in my work with apes, I, I have come to, well, I've been aware of all these constraints because they were out there in the 60s. Mm -hmm. and figuring out what the apes were doing with them was part of what I had to do to get where I wanted to go because I wasn't doing experiments on that particular thing. But this four to seven number interval when we're hearing like tones or things like that, I've explored that over and over with myself and I just can't increase that interval. Uh, I believe that that interval is a little longer in humans than in apes. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that that makes their listening to things a little bit different than ours. And it makes their hearing of music a little bit different than ours and the number of beats in a rhythm that we can hear. It might be just one or two shorter than ours. I believe it also, uh, I should say, there is a lot of turn taking in bonobos at a very high frequency and at a very high rate. And um, it happens in other apes at a lower frequency where they're kind of <laughs> and they're all exchanging, where it probably hasn't been looked at. But in bonobos, it isn't just about that. It's about information, and it's all the time up in the forest. And when I've looked at, with Jared, some of my conversations with Kanzi and Vanvanesha, they're inserting vocal comments in my conversation as I speak. So it's more rapid than this human kind of planning that you're talking about for the next utterance. It's like their utterances are going back and forth so rapidly that they're sometimes not only finishing each other's sentences, they're co-speaking sentences. And when I try to talk, if they're trying to talk with me, I don't know exactly what they're trying to say, but there are pauses in my speech and they're putting their sounds right in those pauses. Now, if I were to try to do that with you, it's impossible to do. So I think there are these constraints that you talk about, and I think they do function in a chunky way exactly as you talk about. <clears throat> the time constraint may have something to do with brain size. Mm -hmm. If you're going to process information and it's going all over the brain like you talked about, then if you've got a bigger brain, it's going to take longer, just the transmission of bouncing over all of those places than if you have a smaller brain. So that 
that might be why they're more they're doing it more rapidly. I think that's, that's interesting. I, I didn't know about you know, this. So, you know, this is also why I'm saying that I, I think I mean, this could also in part be that this is sort of giving the, what, what, what is sort of published so far and what they provide. But it's clearly, that doesn't mean that there is not more going on, but this is just what, what was in this article. So I think this is very, very interesting. Uh, and I was also, from watching some of the videos yesterday, I was also a little bit hesitant in, in in sort of in, in thinking about these as well, so I think it makes a lot of sense. I think one of the things I think is re really remarkable too also is their uh, uh, Kansi and um, Pampanisha and sort of their, their ability to understand English. And I think one of the things that's sort of underestimated oftentimes is that the, the amount of processing that has to go on in order for them to do what they actually do. Uh, in terms of, of, of uh, figuring that out. And, and I think it's even more remarkable given that from this perspective, our language and English in, in, uh, as an example has been adapted to our constraints. Now that means that if you take somebody who has different constraints, they're going to be at a disadvantage, right? Because we are used to having these constraints. That's what has shaped the language. So they are putting in a disadvantage. So it makes it even more remarkable that they can understand English as well as they do, as we also saw in, in the videos yesterday. And I think that's one, one thing that's often underappreciated by in, in, this, in this work. And I think this is what makes it even more uh, sort of astonishing. Um, but, but I think it's also uh, unfortunate that, that this whole literature, this is why I refer to it as an inconvenient truth, right? That we've known about this for a long time. All this work was done in the 60s. And for some reason, nobody had cared about it. And um, until you wrote this paper, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm interested in how the constraints or the sort of skills might be altered. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about the. Well, this particular study I think of has held up that this is about speed of mathematical learning in Chinese and English speakers. And I believe the claim was that the, that the, uh, the all the, the number words are physically shorter in mm -hmm. Chinese and they, and that caused them to, the children to sort of launch their math abilities earlier. And I don't know what the experimental testing that was, but I, so that's a, a launch or initial learning kind of thing, but then, um, is do people get better or at the efficiency of chunking as they practice it? Or are you like are you sort of an enduring constraint um, independent of practice, I guess? So um, so I think you do get better. That's part of the idea. That's the you know the example mm -hmm. that obviously uh, it was the same number of letters in the first and the second mm -hmm. uh, test. So you, the reason why you, you could do the second one is that you have learned, you have learned uh, those constraints. And, and one of the things I want to suggest is that uh, if you look at the experience with language, that can actually increase your working memory capacity. And that might even also happen, I, mean, I could imagine it might happen with all the exposure to English, that if you were, if you were to measure uh, the bonobo's sort of working memory capacity early on for, for elements expressed in language, they would be better after you know, many years of exposure, I, I, would, I, I would expect. So, so yes, you do get better. Now, it's not that you can get infinitely better. There's a, there's a limit to it, so some sort of uh, asymptote in some level, but there are going to be some individual differences as well. Now, we know from other memory studies that if you put your mind to it, you could become really good at, at this kind of chunking. So there's a, a classic memory experiment with SF um, by Ericsson and uh, I forget who the other one was, but um, they had this undergraduate who had sort of unremarkable working memory capacity, sort of exposed to digit, uh, random digit recall. So essentially, it's where you get a string of digits and you just have to recall it. Now, this poor person spent 200 hours on this, uh, which is remarkable in it by itself. But then after, uh, so starting out with like four plus minus one and so in, in recall, he was able to, after these 200 hours in the lab, to actually recall 79 
uh, digits. That's one of those memory athlete things. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, but that's and, training, right? So, it's but not just when it's 79, all the athletes do it by, by jumping, right? Well, they do it. So he was doing it by chunking. So what he did actually, yeah, 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 these so he got he, he was a runner. So he, mm -hmm. and so he would chunk it into to running times and then mm -hmm. and chunk them into other things. Now, mm -hmm. part of this was done, of course, very consciously. So normally we are not aware of this in in, in language. But what we see also in in the learning part is that the, the way we're looking at the statistical learning results is that that's actually an, a, due to exposure. You become better mm -hmm. for these patterns. Now, crucially. It also suggests that it's not necessarily your your skills in one language is not necessarily going to transfer to skills in another language uh, because you have had experience with a particular set of, of distribution regularities for say English that may not transfer as easily to French um, and there is some uh, some interesting uh, suggestions that different languages can afford different kinds of working memory capacities. So there's some suggestion, for example, that speakers of Spanish are better at processing certain kind of sentences compared to English speakers uh, when you control uh, for as much as you can for everything. Because Spanish as a language has a distribution of patterns that uh, allows chunking uh, in certain ways rather than others. Likewise, in German, uh, because of the nature of the language, you also get uh, different uh, ways of chunking that facilitates that. And we're actually in the process of running some experiments at the moment in Germany and in the UK, uh, looking for some of the, you know, to, to demonstrate some of these differences that people have alluded to uh, in the literature. So yes, there, there is a lot of learning going on. In fact, the work by uh, researchers such as Anne Fennell, looking at early processing, um, uh, is a reflection of that, where you see a direct uh, relationship between experience with language and the, the kid's ability to uh, uh, do online processing, for example. So, yeah, it grows with experience, yeah. Yeah, I have a question just about the thing you said last, and about the different languages. So what would explain, or do these uh, constraints maybe also explain how individual languages evolve? And if so, why would we have more efficient languages for chunking and less efficient ones? I mean, what, where does that come from? Um, that's a good that's a good question. So yes, the, the idea is that you do get different languages. Part of what happens with different languages is that, you, that languages have different trajectories through, through a state space. Now also, chunking is not the only thing that's, that plays a role. So there are other kinds of cues, and some languages may weigh other kinds of information uh, that become uh, more important than uh, sort of the, say, the linear order, like in, in English. You have other languages where you have a case marking that can be used to uh, sort of figure things out. And there you get chunking not at necessarily at the word level. So if you look at Turkish, for example, there's some nice Cobus analysis where you get chunking at the level of morphemes rather than at the levels of words per se, because it makes more sense for a, an agglutinal language like Turkish. So Turkish is a language where, where you can uh, express in, in one word roughly what we might express in full sentence in English for those of you who are not familiar with that. So, 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 so different languages have different trajectories. Now, you, you might also have languages that move into an odd part of the space. So, um, actually, I'm, I'm doing some Danish. I grew up in Denmark, and I'm doing work on Danish. So it turns out that Danish might have ended up in, in a really weird part of, of space. So, we have um, uh, data so far indicating that Danish kids are behind in, that, in acquisition of Danish. So, Danish is very hard to learn for, for, for uh, second language learners because it has one of the largest vowel spaces of any language, about 40 vowels. Um, it has specific, it has a really messed up phonology that just makes it really hard uh, for the kids to learn, Danish kids to learn it too. And we've been able to demonstrate that using experiments with babies and so on. We're in the middle of, of, I just got a grant from the Danish government to look at whether it actually affect adults as well. One of the things about term taking is that Danish was in there, but Danish were Danish people were outliers. They were much slower, about 100 milliseconds slower on average than uh, speakers of other languages. Um, uh, so one suggestion is, from our perspective, is that, that different languages have different ways of weighing bottom-up and top-down information. That if the Danish input is, is so impossible to understand. So to give you an example, I'm out on a desert island. If I said that in Danish, it's, 
So, as you can hear, that's, that what happens in Danish is that you tend not to pronounce consonants very clearly, and so you get these long, long, long vowel stretches, and that makes it really hard to figure to actually do chunk. Uh, but it may mean that you rely much more on top-down information in order to understand uh, the language, and that may take a little bit longer, and that's what we are hoping to demonstrate in these experiments that we are conducting now in, in Denmark. We just started in September, so we are looking at uh, phonological representation, we're looking at sentence processing, we're looking at dialogue, uh, these different levels. So we have you know, two postdocs and a uh, PhD student working on that as we speak. Well, maybe not today. But... <laughs> <laughs> I have a question, but I know that Sue has another one. So go well, ahead. With regard to that, that would make how the brain structures information really differently in Danish and perhaps another language. That could make a huge difference in what the brain is doing all through life. Yes. And it's a very good uh, argument for the fact that it's all cultural. And doesn't it then mean this is why we think that this is what's happening during those first early years and even prenatally, this is what the brain is doing. It's forming all of these little chunks and then higher levels of chunks that's going to make the language possible, which is difficult to do later on if you haven't done that at all when you're very young. Right, it, it certainly requires yeah, this, this, this early exposure, and indeed, one of, one of the, one of the uh, suggestions is that you know, different languages have different ways of, of sort of interrelating these things to one another, so as Danish being sort of an, an extreme example, and you're right, that would also suggest subtle differences, uh, certainly in the processing system, that hopefully we should be able to demonstrate also in uh, sort of brain activations for, say, Danish compared to uh, to any speakers uh, to some degree, but so further down the line, we might be able to look at, at, at uh, these kind of uh, situations as well. But for now, we, we're focusing on the behavioral side. But but there's some interesting implications. Uh, now, clearly, Danish people do learn to understand one another, but they may be relying <laughs> more on top-down information. Now, it may also explain why uh, we have this joke that the reason why people in Denmark always come up high on this happiness uh, ratings uh, every time is that Danish people don't actually hear what other people are saying, it's just what they think they're saying. <laughs> but but, but, it, but it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a more like a, 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 a more realistic side of it is that one of the things that a lot of em there's a lot of emphasis on is empathy, empathy in, in Danish and it might just the fact that you have to think more about what the other people might be saying um, uh, you have to engage more in what's sometimes referred to as sort of theory of mind, and so it may actually make you more empathetic towards the other person than if you're only listening to them as such. So you're sort of you're more in, you're interacting at a deeper level with them in, in some sense, and maybe that's why we don't know. But it's an it's a it could be an upside to it. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's very important, and also it would seem to me that. Because this chunking is, is so automatic, you, you're building up this, what you're going to hear before you know what you've heard, actually. So then you, that's what you've heard, and you can't do anything about it. But if you have some kind of top-down, then you have much more flexibility to change how you're organizing the input that's coming in. You'd have some control over that. So actually, we're, we're doing these comparable experiments with Norwegian and Danish, so sort of beautiful natural experiments. So Norwegian uh, is a language that's very much like Danish, except they actually produce their consonants. Otherwise, it's very similar, and it's sort of the, the culture is very similar, the educational system, and so on. But but there is an interesting, you know, going uh, sort of also going back to one of your uh, earlier questions. That there's a nice study by Uli Asun at Princeton, where he was looking at essentially uh, imaging people when they're listening or when they're uh, either producing language or listening to language. And so looking for correlations between um, various aspects of uh, sort of the utterance, so at the phonological level, at the sort of word uh, sentence level, and then at the discourse level. And what he found was that uh, you would find correlations between speakers and listeners uh, in interesting ways. So uh, at the phonological level, they, the speaker, of course, was ahead. So you can look at something called Granger correlation between activity in the brain areas. And uh, at the phonological level, you would have that the speaker would be ahead. At the sentence level, the speaker would be more or less ahead. But at the at the sort of higher level, 
the listener would actually be ahead of the speaker in the way that you're suggesting, sort of kind of uh, predicting what the other person is saying. So there are beginning to be some nice neural data on that as well. So it may be interesting to look at across different languages whether that relationship is weighted in a slightly different way depending on the structure of the language. And so He's looking at what the brains are doing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He's measure, measuring the... Uh, yeah, it's just actually brain activation in FMI. The listener and the, uh, yeah. the speaker. So I'm, I'm not sure he's looking for the right thing, however, to explain the anticipation, but that's something else. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But that's another point. I mean, in your, in your slide about... I don't know if it was in the chunk and pass slide, where you have these uh, very top-down uh, arrow from produ I mean, uh, about production planning from discourse to mm -hmm. acoustics. I mean, is this just a visual way of representing it? Or, I mean, you're not saying that it's just a kind of top-down thing from discourse to acoustics? No, no, no. 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 Okay. That's, so, <laughs> no that's so, so what, what would it be? I mean, is it something like a dynamic system? Is it, how would you represent it in, in a way? Uh, well, you, you can think of it. In fact, that there is some, some, some data that I so talk with some people at the Bass, uh, Bass Center for Brain and Language. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's some interesting data when you look at MEG data. So MEG data is you can look both spatially and temporally at uh, brain activity. And so there you can look at the interaction between sort of different levels. Now, you only look at the lower levels, but you do get some nice, nice way of looking at the interaction. So you're looking at essentially oscillations, yeah. uh, and that's kind of like a dynamical system. So that would be one way of thinking about it, that the way these are sort of encapsulated to one another is that the, the, the frequency you get sort of folded into one another in interesting ways. So you can see the impact of one level in the other ones in the way that the, uh, the, the, so these oscillators oscillate. <laughs> now, I would add to that, since we are um, together between humanists and scientists, etc., that, uh, for instance, the, this guy whose work is relatively unknown in France and completely unknown outside of France, uh, Guillaume, who was a linguist, very isolated linguist, he was trying to come up with, with a kind of psycholinguistics in the beginning of the 20th century, where he was speaking of those kind of dynamical processes in that, that, would gen, that would then support the uh, advent of speech, basically. And so that, that, I mean, sometimes we might go back to some uh, awkward hypothesis that had been completely forgotten and, and find something in, in some of them, I guess, which is also what you were describing about the, uh, this kind of oblivion of everything that was already there in the 60s in terms of chunking uh, short-term memory, etc. Uh, Sue, last question. Last last. <laughs> has done those constraints for chimpanzees and bonobos and gorillas and orangs that would seem to be important to look at. Mm -hmm. And if their constraints are different, then and their speed of turn taking is different, then could it not be that they have language but we just think they don't because our constraints are different than their constraints and maybe the same is true for say whales and dolphins, especially those big whales that have much longer constraints. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what they process these huge, long strings of things. I think yeah, that, that's, a, that's, I think that's, a, that's a good point. So, so what, what it does suggest is that we need to look at the, the kind of systems that they have at the level of their constraints, not at our constraints. I think one of the, one of the problems is in a lot of work on, 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 on sort of looking at other species is that we tend to superimpose our own system on, on them that, and it may not fit. Because, especially from this perspective, if it's really sort of tailored very closely to our specific constraints, then it's not going to work very well for others. Now, it may also have some interesting implications for looking at, at humans who have problems with language for a variety of reasons, that our language that may uh, have adapted to sort of the, the average uh, sort of healthy person may not actually fit to somebody who had, for whatever reason, say a much smaller working memory span due to some sort of genetic problem or and so on. And there might be ways of actually creating systems for them that would work better. So it also we saw the, this, um, uh, the use of lexigrams with, uh, with some some individuals with mental retardation, yes, right? right? So there might be some have interesting... Shown an excerpt oh, of I just had to say one more thing. Can I, I, just, I think <laughs> that as humans get older and the brain starts to not function quite as well and Alzheimer's and dementia and these other things set in, that you're not looking at a different species, you're not looking at a different chi at a child, you're looking at somebody who's had a normal life, normal language, all of these things, 
But some of these same kinds of constraints or things start to happen, and they can't go back and forth at the right rate. They can't understand all words as easily. But in my experience, if you set aside your anticipation of those constraints, and you work with them or talk with them, the reasoning and all these other human skills can, can be there. But as soon as you start acting like they're not there, because they're not functioning in this normal way, that person with that experience just closes in on themselves. And I think it's a really tragic thing that happens in our society. And I'd like to see it not happen to any of us in this room with the enlightenment from your talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.